70 years after Jack the Ripper murdered and disemboweled prostitutes in London's East End, a new generation of prostitutes learned to live with the ever-present fear of a lurking killer. Between 1964 and 1965, a serial killer was operating in London who, due to his modus operandi, was soon given the moniker Jack the Stripper. Also known as the Hammersmith Nude Murders, six victims have been attributed to this one individual with a possible two earlier murders which he may have also carried out as practice runs to perfect his technique and to ensure he could get away uncaptured. Like Jack the Ripper, his victims were prostitutes, though instead of using a knife, the stripper developed a bizarre form of killing by asphyxiation. And just like Jack the Ripper, the stripper left little if any clues. His identity remains to this day a mystery. On 17th June 1959, a naked body of a young woman was found on a towpath in Chiswick. Police officers were carrying out a routine patrol of a known lover's lane, Duke Meadows, on the north bank of the Thames. Duke Meadows was also a site known to the locals as a place where sex workers took their clients. The woman found had been strangled and dumped with no clothes or personal belongings on or around her body. Her underwear and shoes were missing, as were her purse and any other identification. Her dress was torn at the waist and open to reveal her breasts. The pathologist concluded that a death had occurred between midnight and 2 a.m. on 17th June. A post-mortem photo of her face was circulated in the newspapers. An Elizabeth Fig was identified first by her flatmate and fellow sex worker Pauline Mills and later by Fig's mother. Elizabeth was a prostitute who worked on the streets nearby, and police theorized that she had been murdered by a man who had picked her up for sex the night before. A witness said that on the night of the murder, he and his wife had observed a car's headlights as it parked in that area at 12.5 am. Shortly after the lights were switched off, they heard a woman's scream, but thought nothing of it at the time. Police questioned many people and searched the area, but came empty-handed. With little evidence and no leads, the case into her murder soon went cold. Four years later, Welsh-born Gwyneth Rees was found dead in a rubbish tip on 8th November 1963. Investigators later felt Rees may have been a stripper victim due to her being found near the River Thames and because she had been strangled with ligature. Several of her teeth were also missing. She had been missing for nine days with the last known sighting of her being getting into a van on September 29, 1963. Although there were similarities between Elizabeth Figg's murder and Gwyneth Reese's murder, no links were made at that stage. And the case of Gwyneth Reese joined many other London unsolved mysteries lying cold in the police case files. On 2nd February 1964, the first confirmed victim of Jack the Stripper, Hannah Tilford, was found floating in the Thames River by a passing boat. She had been in the water for two to seven days and was found naked, apart from her stockings which had been rolled down to her ankles. Her underwear had been forced down her throat and at least one of her front teeth were missing. Despite being obviously strangled, her cause of death was drowning. She was reported missing 10 days prior to her discovery. Across the next 12 months, a further 5 bodies would be found. All young women, all prostitutes and all found stripped and either drowned or strangled. Two months later, after Hannah's body was discovered, on 8th April 1964, Irene Lockwood was found 
drowned on the foreshore of the Thames at Corny Reach, Chiswick, just a mile away from where Hannah's body was found. Her cause of death was also ruled as drowning, and she was four months pregnant when she was murdered. Police quickly linked her murder not only to Hannah Tailford's but one of the early possible victims, Elizabeth Fig. Weeks after the discovery of her body, a local caretaker, 57-year-old Kenneth Archibald, confessed to killing Irene Lockwood at a Notting Hill police station and was subsequently charged with her murder. But it was later deemed a false confession due to inconsistencies in his version of events. He later recanted his statement, citing depression, and was cleared at trial. Just days after discovery of Irene Lockwood, another body was found, giving police their third suspicious death of a young prostitute in less than three months. On 24th April 1964, Helen Barthelme's naked, tattooed body was found, not on the riverbank, but in an alley 4.5 miles northwest of the location of Irene Lockwood's body near the Boston Manor playing fields. The area was fairly secluded, allowing the killer privacy to dispose of the body. It was this crime scene that gave detectives their first real clue. Helen had been strangled, most likely up to 24 hours earlier. But most importantly, flakes of automotive paint were found on her body. This discovery led police, who by now had started to suspect that they were dealing with a serial killer to believe she had been stored in a workshop or a warehouse of some sort. Detectives believed their suspect was a paint sprayer. Like Hannah Tailford, Barthelme was also missing several front teeth, three to be exact. Then, on 14th July 1964, 30-year-old Mary Fleming was found nude and seated in an upright position at the entrance to a garage in Chiswick which was 1.8 miles from where Hannah Tailford's body was found. Her dentures were missing as well, and it was thought that she had been smothered to death. Paint specks were also found on her body, just as with Helen Barthelme. Many locals reported hearing a vehicle, probably a van, reversing down the street shortly before her body was discovered, though none could identify the car or the driver. For the next three months, all went quiet, until 25th November, when 21-year-old Margaret McGowan, also known as Frances Brown, was found in a car park on Haunton Street, Kensington. Brown was last seen alive on 23rd October 1964 by a colleague and a fellow sex worker, Kim Taylor, who saw her getting into a client's car. Taylor was able to provide a composite of the man that picked her up, as well as a description of the car he was driving. Kim thought it was either a Ford Zephyr or a Zodiac. Her cause of death was asphyxiation by strangulation. One of her front teeth had been forced from its socket, and police noted traces of now familiar paint flecks on her body as well. Jack's last known victim was Bridget O'Hara. She was last seen in early January 1965. Her body was found one month later on 16th February hidden amongst bushes on the Heron Trading Estate in Acton. Traces of paint flecks were discovered on her body as well, but turned out to be industrial paint, not automotive. The paint flecks were sourced to a nearby transformer. Bridget's front teeth were also missing, and investigators determined she died on her knees. Her corpse was partially mummified, either from prolonged storage in a cool, dry place or possibly from the heat of the transformer. A massive hunt for Jack the Stripper was led by Chief Superintendent John Dew Rose of Scotland Yard. He had policewomen dressed up as prostitutes to walk the streets of Notting Hill in the hope of catching the killer. He also sent officers across West London to look for paint spraying sites. They didn't have to look far. The paint pattern was found opposite a paint spray shop on the Heron estate, not far from where Bridget O'Hara's body was found, which forensics were able to match exactly to those found on the bodies. John Dew Rose 
concluded that this was where the bodies were stored before being dumped. Detectives believed the killer must have had some association with the estate and questioned 7,000 people from the area. However, no information could be found on the identity of the killer. In an attempt to force the killer into exposing himself, John Dew Rose held a news conference falsely announcing that the police had narrowed the suspect pool down to 20 men. After a short time, he announced that the suspect pool contained only 10 members, and then 3. However, after months of searches and interviews, the case reached a dead end, and with no new murders after February 1965, no further evidence was gained. For John Duroos, the most likely suspect was a Scottish security guard called Mungo Ireland. Mungo Ireland had a pretty bleak childhood in Scotland, punctuated by frequent beatings. He served in World War II, where he developed a taste for hiring sex workers. He worked as a police officer briefly, but quit after being passed over for detective. Ireland drove a van like the one seen in Cheswick where Mary Fleming was found. He worked the overnight shift 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., just like police suspected the killer would. And he also worked on the estate as a security guard where Bridget O'Hara's body was found. In March 1965, a month after the final murder attributed to Jack the Stripper, Mungo Ireland committed suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning inside his garage. He left a suicide note for his wife, which said, I cannot stand the strain anymore, and finished, to save you and the police looking for me, I'll be in the garage. His decision to take his own life and the timing aroused further suspicion that Mungo Ireland was indeed Jack the Stripper. However, some serious doubts were raised on Ireland being a credible suspect when it was discovered he didn't begin work on the estate until after the bodies of Helen Barthelmy and Mary Fleming were found. He was also in Scotland when Bridget O'Hara was murdered. Various other suspects had been put forward, including light heavyweight champion boxer Freddie Mills. In July 1965, not even five months after O'Hara's body was found, Mills was found dead in his car in an alley in Soho. He had a gunshot wound to the head and a rifle between his knees. His family and friends believed he had been murdered, but the police ruled his death a suicide. Some believe Mills was the killer and had taken his own life as he thought the police were getting close to arresting him. However, no evidence has ever been found to link Freddie Mills to the killings. David Seabrook, in his book Jack of Jumps, wrote that a former Metropolitan Police detective was also a suspect in the opinion of several senior detectives investigating the case. This particular police officer was convicted of various petty crimes while he was serving as a police officer and was sentenced to prison time. It is theorized that because he committed robberies to make his fellow officers look stupid, that upon his release from prison, he graduated to murder for the same reason. Detective Superintendent William Baldock investigated the former Metropolitan Police Detective as a suspect in the murders, but failed to build a case. Tommy Butler, who was a Scotland Yard superintendent at the time of the murders, is another name which appeared as a possible suspect, although he was pointed by a former criminal, Jimmy Evans, in a book he wrote about his life. His allegations were quickly dismissed as being offered by a man with a grudge against a police officer with no evidence to back up his claims. Probably the most credible suspect was Harold Jones. Jones killed two girls in 1921 in the town of Abitillary. His first victim, 8-year-old Freda Burnell, was found sexually assaulted and murdered, but he was acquitted. That acquittal was celebrated by his neighbours who didn't believe he could possibly be guilty. Fifteen days later, his neighbor's 11-year-old daughter, Florence Little, was found dead in Jones' attic, drained entirely of blood. Because he was 15 at the time, he was not liable for death penalty, instead receiving a life sentence. He was let out 20 years later for exemplary behavior. In 1941, at the age of 35, 
after being released from prison, he is believed to have returned to his hometown Abitaleri and visited the graves of his early victims. In 1947, he surfaced in London, married and had a daughter and lived two streets away from Mungo, Ireland. Due to poor record keeping, he was never looked at by the police. In 2011, Neil Milkins published Who Was Jack the Stripper? in which he alleges that the culprit was Harold Jones, but all the evidence is based on coincidence. He reported in his book while researching Jones' movements that Jones had been working as a sheet metal worker living just streets away from Heron Trading Estate at the time of Jack the Stripper's murders and would have used industrial paint spray. There were other similarities as well. The victims of Stripper had been stored prior to disposal. Jones was also thought to have stored his victims as well. Jones kept his victims handkerchiefs. The stripper was thought to keep his victims teeth. Five years before Hannah was murdered, Jones lived just two streets away from her. He later moved to Hammersmith under another assumed name and lived two streets away from both Margaret McGowan and Bridget O'Hara. Despite these coincidences, Harold Jones was never a suspect and he died in 1971 without being questioned. And with no leads to go on, the murders of Jack the Stripper would likely remain unsolved. So guys, before I go, I would really like to thank all of you guys for helping us reach 50,000 subscribers. You know, this channel has grown so much in the last few months and it's all because of you guys. So I really want to thank all my subscribers out there for continuing to support and watch this channel. The support and love from you guys has been absolutely amazing. Now if you have any questions or any suggestions regarding the channel or the content, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. And although there are a lot of you guys these days, I'll try my best to answer all of them. So until next time, have a good day or night and I will see you guys in my next video.